Well, good afternoon and welcome to 660. As I'm sure all the retailers in the room are aware, there are just 36 days until Christmas. And I'm really interested. Who here has put up their tree already? You know who you are. Go on, give us a wave, indicate in chat. Uh, you are a special bunch. I can't believe it. 36 days. How on earth did that happen? Well, speaking of sixes, you are about to meet six startups in 60 minutes. Yes, that's right. It's 660 Club time, the retail edition. I'm Jeremy Bassett. I'm CEO of CoCubed. And in CoCubed, we help retail leaders to meet startups from around the world that can drive digital solutions across their floor uh, shop footprint. Here's a 30 second overview of what we do. Well, at CoCube, we're passionate about connecting retailers and startups. And with that in mind, we've partnered with Retail Week Live to bring 50 of the hottest retail startups to meet the industry. And we're going to meet six of them right now. Retail Week Live will take place in London next year. And for those of you who are retailers, we've got a really exciting opportunity that we'd love you to get involved in. I'll be uh, announcing that at the end of this, but it's an opportunity for you guys to unleash your inner dragon and to explore startups that are relevant just for you. So stick around and I'll share some details of that right after. But here's how today is going to work. In just a minute, you'll hear some quick fire pitches from six startups who are pioneering the retail industry. Then you'll have a chance to meet the startups and other club members in the networking zone right after this. Uh, if you want more details on any of the startups or if you want to request a meeting, you can also head to the expo booth uh, and you can hit them up there. But right now, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for today. Today's guest has been driving growth in direct to consumer brands for over 20 years. She's worked with retailers, including ASOS, Topshop and Whistle, and is now the COO at Made.com. Please join me in welcoming Nicola. Nicola, welcome to the club. Hi, Jeremy. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Not at all. Thanks for joining. So, Nicola, I'd, I'd love to start by just understanding you and your role at Made.com. Yeah, sure. So, I guess me, uh, you, you gave me a brilliant introduction. Thanks so much. I've kind of, I've been working in all of my career in, in retail and for a really big chunk of it in e-commerce as well, kind of moved into e-commerce at, at a time when e-commerce wasn't uh, really a huge part of most retailers' kind of strategic roadmaps. It was still pretty much an unknown thing. Um, and as he said, I've worked with some incredible retailers over the years. At Made, which I joined about a year ago, just over a year ago, in the role of COO, um, I've been kind of doing a huge amount of work to try and just join together how we think about growing the business uh, with the customer in mind, basically. And I think um, Chief Operating Officer is an interesting role because it means lots of different things in lots of different businesses. But um, what Philippe, our CEO, wanted to do when he kind of created the, the CIO role at Made was really think about how we could take all of the core functions of the business. And by that, really, I mean marketing, uh, the logistics and operational side of the business, plus uh, the product side of the business, and really get them working together much more effectively. So I oversee kind of all of the core elements of the business as well as kind of our digital experience side of the business, which is the kind of the digital products we build and the innovation work stream that helps support the core business. And I, and I think that's quite key and it's quite unusual um, to have kind of a COO role that covers kind of, you know, everything from marketing through to product, but also then pulls in digital experience as well and a, a quite a modern interpretation of what, what a COO role does. That gives me a huge amount of luxury because I'm able to kind of have this kind of deep understanding of, of the operational challenges that the business face day to day, 
as well as kind of looking much more kind of longer term on kind of like, okay, well, how does that, how do the operational challenges today or the operational opportunities of today feed into, into the digital products and to the, the innovative solutions that we want to build in the future? Mm. That's such a clever structure and good to hear that um, innovation is playing a central role in that. I mean, what we often see is a, a clear distinction between core operations, which is focused on driving efficiency in the day to day. And then you've got innovation teams that often sit off the side uh, of companies. But it sounds like that is very much embedded at MADE. Is that right? Yeah, it, it is. I mean, it varies to certain extents. I, I like I, I am a, a massive believer that um, there is a point in certain innovation work streams where you have to let small empowered teams just just get on and do stuff. But I think it all comes down to your definition of innovation. I think it's we live in a, a much more nuanced and complex world than just going innovation doesn't have to drive efficiency. Actually, a lot of the most innovative things that we've done at MADE have come out of challenges that are efficiency based challenges. So we started off with something that maybe goes, oh, hey, this is a this is an inefficient um, thing for a customer to have to go through. Or how would we make this a more frictionless experience for the customer, which which is actually an efficiency problem, right? It's it's um, it's something that's not um, not optimal. But then that drives an a, an innovative challenge for for a small team that can work off on the side. So I think it's it's, it's a balance between the two of them. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I know one of the things we say at CoCube is if you want to transform a corporate, you have to transform the core. And I can see that nice balance that you're playing yeah. there. It's really important. Um, so talk us through how you see innovation and the role um, that innovation plays within MADE. I mean, it, it, it is a hugely, it's, it's been an incredible experience actually coming into a business that's kind of like one of the um, smaller businesses I've worked in over the past few years, but but not a small business by any means. And I think it's really refreshing to see a business that's probably younger than businesses I've worked in before and how an, a kind of innovation mindset is just built into the core of the business. So I think we are constantly asking ourselves questions about how uh, how something can be done in a more innovative way. I think the way that I kind of try and chunk it down and think about it um, for us at MADE is there is innovation in kind of the customer experience, which is one work stream. So how do we do things better for customers in a more innovative way for customers? And I think if you look at kind of some of the things that we've done, even recently, like we've just launched um, a, a virtual showroom where we've completely digitized a, 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 like an apartment that sits above our Amsterdam showroom. So you can walk through it and have a, a truly kind of um, immersive experience walking through it as well as a shoppable experience. That's a great example of innovating uh, the core customer experience. So it's something that's um, is it, it's still about shopping. It's still about made. It's still about our current product set, but it's about going, how do we make that experience and that journey better? And then there's a huge chunk that's more about kind of the stuff that customers don't see, which is all about innovating our, our processes that sit behind it. And these are, you know, these are areas that are maybe not the the sexy kind of front end stuff that uh, digital product teams are going to get kind of super excited about, but it is stuff that is transformative within the business. So in, in in there, I would I would you know put in stuff like how do you innovate HR processes to make them way less cumbersome? How do you use um, really smart um, translation technology and uh, uh, NLP kind of software to help you optimize things like product descriptions? How do you um, use technology to optimize um, and innovate in logistic pro logistics processes that basically optimize things like warehouse throughput or carrier management? So that's all a kind of like innovation work stream that sits, you know, way behind what customers see. And then the third bucket, which I think probably talks more to your point about kind of, um, you know, innovation happening on the side of the core business in, in different teams is what I would call kind of business model innovation, which is where we want to put in a completely new kind of thing that, that maybe made has never done before. So, for example, if we if we went, you know, we think the future is is very much based upon um, uh you know, uh, designing your your space in 3D and, and and charging the customer for that as a service, or we wanted to do rental, or we wanted to do 
um, a resale platform or something like that, that would be a kind of like a business model innovation work stream. So I tend to think about it in those three areas, customer experience, process innovation and business model innovation. Oh, very interesting. Um, so uh, I, I guess you mentioned like quite a few different areas there where innovation is happening. Where would you say the big priorities are for made over the next year or two when it comes to innovation? What are the big trends or technologies that you're looking at and, and what sort of solutions are you trying to find there? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think, again, there's probably probably, uh, th you know, maybe two or three things that, that are super interesting to us. I think in the context of what's happened this year, trying to think about how we uh, blend uh, the benefits of a physical experience with a digital experience uh, ever more kind of intuitively and uh, inspiringly in the future is a really kind of key thing that we're we're interested in at the moment so you know virtual appointments uh kind of uh, 3d design services uh ar vr um are, are very much at the forefront of of how we're thinking about solving you know some of the big challenges that have arisen out of covid but i think will provide pretty structural shifts in in retail over the next few years and then the second one which i mentioned was you know there is the, the, the power for kind of, you know, uh, AI and ML to help with optimizing internal process is still huge. And I think even in a, a young and very focused uh, kind of digital retailer like MADE, we look around and we can probably spot, you know, 20 different types of, of technology that we'd love to put in the background to, to help us optimize what we do in the background ever more efficiently. If, if I just even look at something like, you know, a returns operation, which is going to become a much more meaningful part of our business over, over the coming years, not, not because people are returning more stuff, but I think we will take more responsibility to, um, to, to return products and reuse them more effectively, because I think, you know, we're all going to be under pressure to, to make ourselves uh, more accountable to, to sustainability standards. And I think there's a huge opportunity for technology innovation to help with that. So even if you look at kind of things like, you know, blockchain, which we, which we were all talking about a few years ago, I think you look at what technologies uh, underpinned by blockchain could do to kind of like traceability and kind of um, sustainability and it, that stuff like that is really interesting for us. Um, we're doing a lot of work at the moment actually around e-commerce and returns in particular. It's a fascinating space. Uh, but we'll see some uh, solutions to some of the issues you mentioned here today. So do stick around. Uh, we're about to kick off with the six pitches now. But Nicola, thank you so much for joining. Thank you for those insights. Um, and we'll look forward to staying in touch. Thanks, Jeremy. P pleasure. Right. Thank you. All right. So uh, it's now time to dive into the pitches and what a lineup we have for you today. These are going to be intentionally fast and furious, two minutes each. So buckle up and we'll dive straight in. So with lo local lockdown, circuit breakers and social distancing now part of everyday life, being able to book customer appointments and schedule staff in a smart way has never been more important. Here with a solution to help retailers do just that. Uh, from Appointed, please welcome Leah. Leah, over to you. Hi, everyone. My name is Leah Hutchin, and I am the founder and CEO of Appointed. Appointed is an online booking and customer engagement platform, and we're enabling retailers to connect with their customers wherever they are. And as Jeremy said, in the new normal, um, we are then um, connecting them virtually and in person and giving them a whole host of features to give them great customer service while keeping customers safe and keeping revenue flowing. We're seeing some amazing results with our retailers who are who are using us both virtually and in store. We're seeing a 300% rise in basket size and we've got conversion to sales stats of up to 100%. So 100% of people who are booking an appointment are spending money when they either come in store or join the brand on a virtual personal shop. 
one of our um, furniture retail um, CEOs apparently refers to appointed as the oil well because we're driving that much revenue for them. We work with a whole host of different retailers from Mamas and Papas to Liberty to Moss Bros to Charlotte Tilbury, Space and K, Westfield Shopping Centres and a whole host of others. And our enterprise booking widget um, showcases brands at their best. So it, um, it embeds onto a brand's website and takes the full omni-channel journey from the that very first engagement right the way through through communications via text message and email um, we're doing bookable fitting stores we're offering book to browse so removing any of the queuing doing virtual um, zero touch personal shop and whether that's fully virtual or it's starting virtual and segueing into store depending um, on our, our lockdown restrictions. We've got buffers in there for social distancing and sanitization, um, a capacity flex to really make sure that your store isn't going above um, capacity. So we're just about allowing you to flex in and out and really manage your um, manage your customers' relationship, both virtually and um, in person for an omni-channel relationship that can last. Brilliant. And Leah, I mean, all this sounds perfect. And of course, it, it, um, you know, it's right on uh, in terms of timing for COVID and all of the issues that we're facing right now. But what about in six months? Do you think something like this will still be relevant? Absolutely. Um, so we've worked with retailers for a long time now. Some of our retailers um, we've worked with for around three years. Um, historically, it would be powering events in store. So it would be a, a good example is Mamas and Papas with their parent to be events and their um, different consultations and such like. We've moved a lot of that online and I don't think that's going to go away anytime soon. I think the omni channel, you know, as Nicola was saying earlier, that omni-channel journey um, and making sure that you're building a relationship and deepening a, re a relationship um, in different um, ways is, is definitely more important than ever. So we historically around 60% of what Pointed did is retail during COVID times, we're probably close to 80% and we're just blown away by the way we're seeing retailers really innovate and really just build a new way to, to sell and delight. Um, so yeah, we're, we're very excited about what the future brings for um, retail and appointed. Very cool. All right, Leah, we'll catch up in networking. And of course, if you're interested in appointed, you can also go to the expo zone right after this and uh, click on the connect button. And uh, Leah and the team there will be in touch. Thanks for joining, Leah. Thank you. It's over to our third company now. And with e-commerce enjoying record growth, Google Shopping is an increasingly important tool for retailers. But getting it right is not always easy. So here with a solution to help retailers unlock the full potential of Google Shopping from Bidnamic, please welcome Liam. Liam, Hi. over to you. Hi, yeah, great. So, um, so yeah, obviously huge, huge demand um, from, from massive explosion of retailers, whether it's retailers coming online for the first time or, or very established retailers. But one thing that they're all trying to do is get the attention of the customer at the point that they're shopping. And there's no uh, better uh, ads unit than, um, than Google Shopping, which is designed exclusively for uh, e-commerce retailers to find customers at the point that they're searching online. Um, the problem with this is there's typically only five tiles on the carousel, which you can see on the, the right hand side of the, uh, of the screen. And the first position is known as the top impression, and that will win around 60 to 65 percent of the clicks. So it's incredibly important that retailers get to on the carousel, fight through the competitors and get to the front. The problem is that the more that they uh, the more they pay, uh, obviously, the more expensive it gets. And not all small businesses or even large businesses can afford to do that. So that's where our technology comes in. So we're a machine learning uh, platform um, built by a huge wave of PhD um, re of engineers to really understand the many, many buying signals from the time of day, the location, right down to the keyword that someone is typing in um, to, to just define at that moment uh, what, how much to bid to be profitable. So we're assisting over, over 100 uh, retailers, many in America, many in the UK, um, from large high street uh, brands to some of the world's largest uh, digital agencies, as well as um, small to medium sized retailers as well. So really leveling the, the playing field for, for advertisers and retailers to, to win more customers uh, through Google Shopping. This is great, Liam, and a super powerful tool there for, for retailers. When it comes to looking at the future, uh, what's the role of Bidnamic in helping to facilitate the future of retail for e-commerce clients? 
Yeah, so we're, we're really focused on understanding the product range that retailers are selling, um, understanding at what point they're going to convert, what's the margin of those products, and what, what search terms are customers really going to be searching when they're going to look to, to buy. So we call that the purchase intent. So we're really unlocking the power of this, this ad channel, which is Google Shopping, for the millions of e-commerce retailers so that they can um, either, you know, we typically get the call when it's they want to increase their profitability. You know, Google Shopping is a proven channel for them, but they really need to increase that profitability. Maybe it's just too cost, too, too expensive. Alternatively, it's when they, they know it's very profitable, they know it's a great channel, but they want far more volume. So that, that is kind of two two times we get the call and um, yeah, and we, we look to assist businesses. Thank you, Liam. We'll keep chatting and networking right after this. And of course, if you're interested in Bidnamic, check out the booth there, click on connect and Liam and the team will be in touch. But right Super now, fun. that's three down, three to go. Uh, and it's no doubt that 2020 has been a tough year for most of us. For customers, that means they're going to be looking at ways to save money on great deals, cashbacks, and for retailers, they're looking for incremental sales. Well, a solution that delivers for both of these audience uh, is Upside Savings. And from Upside, please welcome Brian. Brian, over to you. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Uh, pleasure to be here and uh, lovely to talk to you. Thank you. Um, so yes, absolutely. What, what we do is we help consumers to save. Um, so they save for a rainy day, so um, so they can save into a nicer uh, or say, save into a savings pot. Um, but we we use open banking to help seamlessly to bring benefits, incentives, effectively fuel the saving through customers uh, shopping in select retailers. So we have a full suite of data. So from the get go, uh, we have customers data in terms of the last two stroke three years of spend. So a retailer can see that, can target customers, can understand who's been shopping with you, how frequently, uh, segment the marketplace and see who you, who's, who's a very frequent customer, who's less frequent, who do you want to incentivize in different ways. That can be broken down across all the demographic matrices but it's all based on physical spend. So as you run the, uh, the incentives, you can absolutely see uh, how you've driven the dial. And most importantly, I'm an accountant myself, uh, the, the, the level of real incremental profitability that you've brought through. Um, and you can target customers who've never come to you. So with most retailers, they see their own customers. In this way, you see customers who've never been with you and you also understand the extent to which they've been to your competitors as against yourself so it really it really is a sort of a customer seeking missile fascinating and graham how does this differ from other sites that are helping retailers to offer incentives to customers So I, I think it I think it is that completely interactive piece. So the, the ability to see real data, to see data outside of your own store, and then to be able to target customers based on what you can really see and watch their behavior in a dashboard as you increase market share. You can also segment the data into different areas. So for example, take a, a grocer like Sainsbury's. Well, they'll have, they'll have competitors in the fuel space, so you can see spend versus ExxonMobil or Chevron or whoever else in the petrol space. You can, you can compare yourself to the other large grocery, grocery shopping experiences and equally just express stores or whatever else. A retailer like Halfords, where you might go there from a car point of view and the competitors are different as against bicycles, as against camping. So all, all of that is open for the retailer to be able to see and take real action. Okay, very cool. Well, thank you, Brian. That was great pitch. And uh, we'll catch up with you in the networking zone. And of course, if you're interested in Upside, please do check out their booth in the expo zone right after this. Uh, thanks, Brian. We're gonna move on to our thank new you, company. Uh, so our fifth pitch, uh, is we're turning our focus 
into retail logistics. And more and more of us are obviously shopping from home. Last mile delivery is well and truly under the spotlight. And a smart data-driven approach to this is Gopher. So from Gopher, please welcome Graeme. Graeme, over to you. Thanks, Jeremy. Good afternoon, guys. So yes, I'm Graeme. Are a courier company, same day courier company, that covers the entire UK, all four countries. And essentially, it's a courier company that punches well. We work with household names from, from Boots, Lloyds, Paul Smith, HelloFresh, and Co op. And these large companies, these huge companies, trust us um, very much so in many ways, just like many small companies. The reason they trust us, the reason that we're different, the reason that we is our digital experience. Everything you do is online. You can see the courier from end to end. Where they are, you can even see who they are by image. You have full access to the courier and you can have directly at any time that you want. So as a courier platform, as a courier business, excuse culture, and we put the couriers at the very heart of our business. That lends itself to the service levels with an industry high of around 85 on our net promoter score. Three words, efficiency and reduce our And we do many things in the artificial intelligence arena as well. And even partner up with other AI companies to see just how good our software and our platform is. We have 2,000 careers and over 9,500 careers wanting to join this platform to join this movement because of where we've been and where we've been we really do want to change the career industry and make it more retail friendly and career friendly Jeremy? that is perfect Graham. um and uh, you know impressive numbers there for a company that uh, has not been established that long, but making a big impact in this space. What's the USP behind Gopher, Graham? What do you do differently in the last mile? Oh. Yeah, so I've been in the industry for over 20 years now in final mile and logistics. Yeah, it's okay, yeah. Can you hear me okay? It's a slight pause, but that's fine. Sorry. Yeah, uh, the biggest USP for us is our complete transparency. And, our, and also our rates of pay for our careers as well. We believe that our careers aren't our careers, they're everyone's careers. So we make them part of the journey. So from a retailer, through the logistics company, through to the courier, through to the customer, you will see the same transparent journey. And that really means that everyone is truly connected. I feel that a lot of courier companies actually put the customer ahead of the courier, and that creates a disconnect in service levels. So by creating everyone as equals in the journey, okay. that is where. Very cool. Thank you, Graham. We'll keep the conversation going in networking. And of course, check out Gopher in the expo zone as well if you're interested in connecting there. But right now, it's time for our last company. And for our final pitch, we're going to stick to the theme of logistics. And behind the scenes of retail is a huge amount of reusable packaging, from pallets to crates to cages. Well, helping retailers keep track of their packaging and to stock that in a smart way, we've got Sensize. And from Sensize, we have Luke. Luke, over to you. Just in time. Can you hear me, guys? Perfect. You can okay, speak. perfect. Okay, so I, so we're Sensize. We're a um, company based in Cambridge in the UK. We're a bunch of wireless technology um, geeks. Um, previously, before Sensize, we did a lot of stuff in Bluetooth. Uh, if you've got a Bluetooth headset or are using one now, chances are we developed some of the technology in there. But what we're doing with, with Sensize is technology to track reusable packaging. So, so reusable packaging, isn't, a lot of people don't really think about it that much, but typically a big retailer will have more than one million items of reusable packaging. Things like roll cages, pallets, reusable plastic crates. And um, it's really not managed well at the moment. In fact, some of, some of our customers prior to working with us were losing 50% of their reusable packaging every year, uh, which is obviously very expensive and has big inefficiency um, problems because even though they're relatively insignificant, if you're running a, um, 
a, uh, a uh, home delivery service for a supermarket and you don't have um, sufficient plastic crates, then you can't send the vans out. Um, so it is um, it's significant and losing a lot also costs a lot of money. So our big idea is we, we want to enable you to track all of your reusable packaging. Um, now, traditionally, that's been completely impossible because, um, you know, these aren't expensive items. So putting a, an advanced tracker on all of them is um, too expensive. So what we've done with our experience in low power wireless is develop very, very low cost trackers um, that mean that you can put a tracker onto all of your reusable packaging and really keep an eye on, on exactly where all of it is. Uh, so that's us in one minute. <laughs> That is perfect. Great overview there, Luke. Uh, what are the benefits of tracking reusable packaging? Well, that's a good question. So there, there are a lot. Um, so first of all, I mean, the, one of the big problems is that a lot of this stuff gets lost. Um, one of our customers was losing 2,000 reusable plastic crates per week um, in their home delivery um, service. And we worked with them. We, we got them a 90% reduction in, in lost crates as a result of putting the system in. That's saving them a lot of money. Um, that was a particularly good case. But, you know, typically we see better than 50% reduction in, um, in loss. Um, with a, we're also working with um, a couple of courier companies, and they typically see a 25% increase in utilization. So they can do the same with, 25, with 75% of the fleet, which saves them a lot of money. Um, and it also helps them to greatly reduce the um, labor costs because if, in this particular case, they use a lot of roll cages. And if they don't have roll cages to load up the clothes, for example, they need to send out to a, a, a retailer, um, then, you know, they have, to, they have to do a lot of hand packing. So we can save them a lot of money on, um, on um, operational costs as well. Okay. Very interesting and very compelling, I imagine, for a lot of retailers. Luke, thanks for joining. We'll uh, catch up in networking. And, uh, of course, please do check out Sensize in the Expo Zone as well. Uh, and so a massive thanks to six uh, startups for giving those great pitches, a really good insight into uh, some practical solutions to the challenges that we face today. We're about to head into the networking uh, zone. But before we do that, I promise you an exclusive opportunity. And here it is. If you're impressed by the startups that you saw here today, but you haven't found a solution that you're looking for, well, I want to encourage you to unleash your inner dragon as part of the Retail Week Retail Innovation Challenge. Here's how it's going to work. Give us your challenge, and we'll find three game-changing startups that are solving that issue. We'll do this as part of Retail Week Live, uh, and you'll have the chance to work with them to run a pilot. Uh, we'd love to include you in this. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun, and it's going to be uh, what we do for 660 as part of Retail Week Live next year. So drop me an email if you'd like to be involved in that. We'd love to include your brand in there, and we'd love to find some solutions to your problems. It doesn't cost a thing. The only thing we ask is that you ring fence 10K to run a pilot so that this is not just tech tourism. It's actually quite practical. Uh, of course, if you don't find a solution, you don't have to spend the 10K. Um, but if you do, then hopefully we can find a solution to your problem and you can give an opportunity to a startup as well. All right. You've heard the pictures. Now it's time to head over to the networking zone, uh, connect with other members. We've got some amazing members in here and it's really fun. It's a, a two to three minute rotation. You will not get stuck with anyone. Uh, and uh, if you like them, you can also connect and it will also automatically share details. And of course, if you found any of the startups interesting, then head over to the Expo Zone as well. You can check out a little bit more information about them there. And you can also click uh, the connection button and it will link you directly to the startups. Finally, if you've got any suggestions for how we can make these sessions more useful, uh, I'd love to hear from you. Drop me, me an email. But for now, thank you for joining and I'll see you in the networking zone.